يعلم ما بين أيديهم وما خلفهم ولا يحيطون به علما الحمد لله الحمد لله خالق الوجود من العدم وجاعل النور من الظلم فمخرج الصبر من الألم وملك التوبة على الندم فنشكره على المصائب كما نشكره على النعم ونصلي على رسوله الأكرم بالشرف الأشم والنور الأتم والكتاب المحكم وكمال النبيين والخاتم سيد ولد آدم الذي بشر به عيسى بن مريم ودعا لبعثته إبراهيم عليه السلام حين كان يرفع قواعد بيت الله المحرم فصلى الله عليه وسلم وعلى أتباعه خير الأمم الذين بارك الله بهم كافة الناس العرب منهم والعجم الحمد لله الذي أنزل على عبده الكتاب ولم يجعل له عوجا والحمد لله الذي لم يتخذ ولدا ولم يكن له شريك في الملك ولم يكن له ولي من الذل وكبره تكبيرا والحمد لله الذي نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونؤمن به ونتوكل عليه ونعوذ به من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له ونشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له ونشهد أن محمدا عبد الله ورسوله أرسله الله تعالى بالهدى ودين الحق ليظهره على الدين كله وكفى بالله شهيدا فصلى الله عليه وسلم تسليما كثيرا كثيرا أما بعد فإن أصدق الحديث كتاب الله وخير الهدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وإن شر الأمور محدثاتها وإن كل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار قال الله عز وجل في كتابه الكريم بعد أن أقول أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إذا جاءك المنافقون قالوا نشهد إنك لرسول الله والله يعلم إنك لرسوله والله يشهد إن المنافقين تكاذبون رب الشرح صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي اللهم ثبتنا عند الموت بلا إله إلا الله والله مجعلنا من الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر آمين يا رب العالمين I'm going to dedicate the khutbah today to uh, a story from the life of the Prophet وسلم, that culminates in the coming of the Qur'an. And this is a story of how the surah of the hypocrites was revealed, surah al-munafiqun was revealed. Our messenger والسلام, used to go on multiple expeditions, military expeditions. And one such expedition was the people of Bani Mustalaq. And to the long story short, for the purposes of khutbah, is that when the Muslims suffered damages and uh, actually quite a few losses in the Battle of Uhud, word spread that Medina is injured. And so their defenses may not be as strong. And there were lots of different tribes in the region and some of them were interested not in attacking Muslims and attacking Islam, but making an easy quick buck. A lot of times the way they would attack each other, the motivation was economic. One such tribe was Bani Mustalab. They figured right now their armies have suffered a defeat. They're pretty injured. They're not going to be able to defend themselves. Let's go in and attack Medina. Easy money. So that was their motivation for rounding up their forces and coming at Medina. The Prophet ﷺ got wind of this. He figured out that they're on their way. And the best defense is offense, so he prepared a small battalion, including himself. And he went after them instead. And so now the Muslims are on their march towards Bani Mustalab. And as they head there, the, there's not really even much of a battle, and over a hundred of them are taken as prisoners of war. So, because their motivations weren't really ideological, it's not like they were willing to die for their cause, they were just trying to make some money. So they lose pretty quickly. And not only do they lose, there's over a hundred prisoners of war. And the Prophet of Allah is now has to decide what to do with these prisoners. And what he does is he releases all of them and sends them back to the tribe. And so now these POWs, their families, loved ones are crying at home knowing that what the norm is with prisoners of war is either they're turned into slaves or they're executed. This is what happens with them. And they're already mourning the loss of their loved ones and here the, their loved ones are coming back in and they just can't process this. So as a, as a result of that, the entire tribe took shahada. The shock of the, the character of the Prophet led to the entire tribe of Bani Mustalaq becoming Muslim. 
Now the, the Muslims are heading back. So this was not a rigorous battle, this wasn't a difficult journey, but regardless, there are, you know, there are two groups of Muslims that are on this journey. There's the Muhajirun and the Ansar, the migrants who came from Mecca, who moved to Medina, who were basically given asylum in Medina, they weren't residents of Medina, and they were sponsored and supported economically by the people who lived in Medina, the Ansar, the, the helpers. So the army is made up of both, people from Mecca and people from Medina. And they're in line, and you know, it's a, it's a desert journey, it's a hot journey, regardless. And they stop over at a well. And when they stop at a well, everybody's in line, waiting their turn to get some water. And you know, if you're having a hot day, and you're on a difficult journey, it kind of gets on your nerves. Sometimes, you know, they say the best way to get to know somebody is when you travel with them. Because they start getting annoyed, and then the ugly side of their personality starts coming out. They get, start getting agitated. Well, that sort of thing happened. One person in line trips over another. And the person he trips over pushes him back. It's a kind of a normal thing, except the person who tripped and the one who pushed back, one was from Mecca, the other one was from Medina. So when he pushed him back, it kind of turned into a little bit of a fight. And one kicked the other. The Makkan, names aren't necessary now, the Makkan kicked the Medina. And he's, he's down on the floor. And as he falls to the floor, the thought that comes to him is, this guy from Mecca, he's going to kick me like that? I'm going to call my people. So he says, Ya Lal Ansar. He calls helpers. Lal Ansar. Which, which group is the helpers? The people of Medina. So he wants his people to round up behind him because he's in trouble. And the other go, oh, you're going to call your people. I know how to call my people. I got people too. Ya Lal Muhajireen. He calls the Muhajireen. And so now, what was a, a misunderstanding and a little bit of a scuffle between two individuals turns into a bunch of people from Mecca and a bunch of people from Medina about to go at it against each other. And voices are being raised and the skirmish is about to break up. Mind you, this is actually not too long ago, they were one army fighting a common enemy. And on their way back, this comes out. This emerges, erupts. Now as this erupts, the word of this comes to the Prophet And when he hears this, he says, Leave it. This needs to be just dropped. This subject needs to be dropped, not escalated any further. Because this word that they use, the words that they've used, have a stench to them. They stink. Muntina. Kalimatul Muntina. It's very strange that the Prophet said that, and I want to elaborate that a little bit, even though that's not the subject of my khutbah today. You see, when the people, when the person who fell from Medina called the people of Medina, he didn't say, Ya Ahl al Medina, or Ya Ahl al Yathrib, people of Yathrib, people of Medina, he didn't say that. He said, Ya Dan Ansar. He said, Helpers. That is a title that the Prophet gave them, that the Quran gave them. That is a word of honor. To be called an Ansari is to actually be called by the greatest contribution of your life. You got to be labeled by Allah Himself as someone who helped, you understand? So they are being recognized by their contribution to the faith. When the Makkan fell and he called his people, he didn't say people of Makkah, join me. He said, Ya al Muhajireen. People who migrated, essentially migrated, leaving their money, their families, their, their life that they've known. They've left everything behind for the sake of Allah alone for their loyalty to the Messenger In other words, both of these words, Muhajirun and Ansar, are beautiful words. They're words used to describe some remarkable people in the Qur'an. These are words of honor. These are words of honor. And these words, what's behind them? Behind each of them is the sacrifice made by each of these groups. That's what's behind these words. And yet, when the Prophet hears this, he says these words have a smell to them, a stench to them. Why? Because when you have a name, and you have a title, and that title represents a service to the religion, a service to Allah, but that title is now used to distinguish yourself from other Muslims, to separate yourself, and to identify yourself as someone who's part of one gang, one group, in opposition or in competition with another gang, another group. That those same words that are supposed to be honorable have a stench to them. Now how does that apply to us today? There are Islamic centers, masajid, 
Dawa organizations, educational organizations, Islamic schools, Sunday schools, charity groups, all of these organizations have <coughs> names. They all have a website, they all have a Facebook page, they all have a logo, they have an identification. And that's a good thing. They're supposed to be. The only way you can get work done, really, is by unifying and organizing and institutionalizing. And so that's a necessary thing. But when one MSA or one youth group starts seeing themselves in competition with another, when they start getting bothered, hey, they had a convention, ours wasn't as big as theirs. Next time we're going to have it on the same weekend. Let's see how much damage we can do. When they start seeing themselves in some way or shape or form as opposed to the other, or when, they, when you look at another Muslim and you say, well, I follow this school of thought, or I follow that school of thought. I'm, I subscribe to the teachings of this scholar, I, as opposed to someone who else subscribes to the teachings of another scholar who's more fond of them. And as soon as they walk into a masjid, oh, he's from the other, mm. yeah. I mean, I'm praying next to him, but knowing that he's from the other team, but in any case, salamu alaikum. But even, even the tone of your salam will change from one to the other. This is kalimatul muntina. These words may represent something beautiful in and of themselves. A learning of the deen, a teaching of the deen, a service to the deen. But when these words become a way of distinguishing Muslims from each other and separation, then they have a dirty smell to them. That's still not my story. The story is word didn't just spread about this little argument to the Prophet It spread to this other individual whose name is Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn Salul. For short, we're going to call him Ibn Ubay. This man was a politician. He was hoping to become the governor of Medina. Those plans fell apart because the Prophet moved there, alayhi salatu wasalam, and now basically de facto, he's the governor of Medina. And so his plans, and as a matter of fact, he was so ready to rule Medina that his throne had already been prepared. He was going to be, I'm calling it governor, he was going to be the sovereign king of Medina, they were declaring him king. And that entire election, null and void, because the Prophet ﷺ moved to Medina. Unanimously, everybody decided that no, no thanks, the leader of Medina is the Prophet ﷺ. So he was already politically defeated. And the only reason he joined the Muslims, it's clear, is because if you can't beat him, join him. So he's part of this group, but he's sort of burnt about his political aspirations falling apart. He hears word of this fight. And he secretly calls a meeting. <coughs> This is where things get interesting. He, he calls a meeting of all the people from Medina, the Ansar, as many as he can get, into his tent. And you know the Muslims, they travel in a caravan. At the front of the caravan is the Prophet ﷺ and his, the people closest to him. You can imagine that Ibn Ubay is all the way in the back, as far back away from the Prophet ﷺ as he can be. And he's gathering as many of the people of Medina as he can, and then he gives them a speech. Did they dare do this? Who is he referring to as they? The people of Makkah, the Muhajirun. Did they dare do this? قَدْ نَافَرُونَ وَكَاثَرُونَ فِي بِلَادِنَا They have overrun our city. These immigrants came and they overpopulated our city. And they're running around everywhere. We have too many of them now. وَاللَّهِ مَا أَعَدَّنَا وَجَنَابِبَ قُرَيْشْ إِلَّا كَمَا قَالَ الْأَوَّلْ سَمْ مِنْ كَنْبَكْ يَأْكُلْكْ This riffraff of Quraysh, these street you know, peddlers from Quraysh that we have housed in our city, they remind me of the old Arab saying, you feed a dog and it come back, comes back to bite you. That's the speech he's giving in his tent about the Muhajirun, calling them dogs of Makkah. That are now, we fed these dogs and they're biting us back. That's the speech he's giving. And then he says, أَمَّا وَاللَّهِ لَأَرَّجَعْنَا إِلَى الْمَدِينَةَ لَيُخْرِجَنَا الْأَعَزُّ مِنْهَا الْأَدَلْ I swear to God, when we get back to Medina, we, the most dignified, we are the people of honor, we should get these undignified people out of our city. We should get rid of this scum. This is the speech he's given. Now, Then he turned to his people, meaning the Medinan Muslims, and he said, this is what you brought on your own selves. You opened up your whole land to them. You shared your money with them. If you stop giving them money, they're going to go back someone else. They'll go somewhere else. The only reason they're here is because of your money. That's his speech. And he's giving this in his tent. And so, There's a boy in the audience. And actually, my story is entirely about this boy. He's about nine years old. 
He's sitting in the audience too. Now, when you know a khutbah is going on and there's children in the audience, most people are worried, man, is this kid gonna make noise? Or is he playing games? Nobody really pays attention to the child in the audience. Zaydi bin Hattab, this nine-year-old boy, is listening to this filthy speech being made by Ibn Ubayy, trying to rile the Muslims of Medina against the Muslims of Mecca. He runs over to his uncle and tells him the whole speech word for word. His uncle then reports this, goes to the Prophet's tent, all the way to the front, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and walks in, can I, can I speak? My nephew just told me, this is what's going on. Umar bin al-Khattab is sitting next to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Umar bin al immediate response is, لَقَدْ عَرَفْتُ رَجُلًا I know a guy, I know what to do. I can send him in, he'll sit in the audience, he'll scoot up, scoot up, scoot up until he's all the way to the front and he'll slice his neck. Just give the word. And now you, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, no, the people will say, Muhammad kills his own. You know, the people, and by the way, if you might think Umar bin al-Khattab has this extreme response, understand something. Anybody who has any experience in the military knows these men are on a military expedition. And within a military expedition, if a group from within your own army tries to rile up some against others, this is actually considered an act of treason, espionage, punishable immediately by death. Across armies in the world even today. So what Umar is actually suggesting is standard military protocol. Not if anybody talks trash, they should be killed. But in, the, in an army situation, in a military situation, that kind of dissent is punishable by death. And so, the Prophet ﷺ says, no, call him here. So they call Ibn Ubay. And Ibn Ubay shows to the tent of the Prophet ﷺ. What have you been saying? We've come to hear you say, said this, this, and this. Would you like to explain yourself? And all this time, the boy, Zayn ibn al is sitting outside the tent. And unlike buildings today, a tent is not soundproof. So Zayn is outside, but he can hear the meeting going on inside. And the Prophet ﷺ asks Ibn Ubay, what have you been saying? And he says, Wallahi, I swear to God, you are the messenger of Allah. Why would I ever say something like that? We came here to sacrifice our lives. I can't believe you're even suggesting this. What kind of person would testify against me and say these lies? I am so offended right now. And he starts getting angry and starts giving this offended speech and how dare the Prophet ﷺ even suggest that he made such a speech. And he's just furious. And the Prophet ﷺ says, you can go. He tells him, you can go. And when he leaves, Zayn who's outside, ran away to his own tent. He reports he ran away to his own tent and curled up and started crying and said to himself, لَقَدْ صَدَّقَهُ رَسُولُ اللَّهُ وَكَذَّبَنِي The Prophet believed that he was telling the truth and I was lying. The Prophet thinks I'm a liar and he told the truth. Because you know, in kids' language, Ibn Ubay just got called to the principal's office and then he, got, he had to explain himself, and he came up with a story, and then he didn't get in any trouble, and he walked right off. And this kid going, I just told on him, and he didn't get any detention or nothing? That must mean they didn't believe my story. So now he thinks that the Prophet thinks of me as a liar. And he's, he didn't say this to the Prophet As a matter of fact, he never directly spoke to the Prophet He spoke to his uncle, who then spoke to him. He was just outside. So he's in his tent crying. <coughs> and a few moments later, his uncle comes and says, the Prophet is calling you. Rasulullah is calling you. Now this is going to be a direct conversation between this nine-year-old and the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And he comes in and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has him sit down so that when they're sitting on the floor, his knees are touching the Prophet's knees. And as they're sitting there, he turns to him and he says, لَقَدْ صَدَّقَكَ Allah. Allah proved that you were telling the truth. And Allah revealed Surah Al-Munafiqun. And the entire Surah, the entire Surah Al-Munafiqun was revealed at once. All of it. And the first person to hear that Surah was that child. Allah revealed the Surah to Rasulullah Wasallam. Rasulullah Wasallam would normally recite the Surah and the Surah spreads. But before it spread, He said, call him. Call Zayd. As if to say, the feelings of that child and the emotions of that child were important enough that the revelation of this surah should be given first priority from Allah to Jibreel, Jibreel to the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, to Zayd ibn al-Qam first, <laughs> and then everyone else. How important are the feelings of a child? 
How important is it for a child to feel respected, to feel dignified? How easy is it for a Muslim in our homes? I mean, Quran is recited, Alhamdulillah, we're learning, we're, we're, we're trying to practice our faith, and yet at the same time, when it comes to our kids, we're so harsh. When it comes to our kids and their feelings, so easy to call them names. Ah, oh, this one's just a liar. Ah, uh, this one's just, he's just got anger problems. This one's, been, I, one time I was talking to a parent, and they, they, they were talking, you know, people just opened up in conversation to me, and they said, can you help me with my son? He's got, a, he's got an anger problem. He's been very angry lately. I was like, okay, so what's going on with him? Do you know how, when that changed? I don't know, since he's been going to this new school. I was like, okay, did you ask him what's happening at school? No, he's just, I don't know, he's just punching walls and angry all the time, doesn't want to talk. Yeah, so something's happening. Let's find out what's happening. Let's call the mom. Maybe mom knows more. Dad's at work all the time. So call mom. He's just bad. Okay, so when did he turn bad? He was born bad. <laughs> Seriously, mom? If you, if you're so easy for you to say that to me, then I'm sure this child has been hearing it for a long time. That you're just bad. You, that's just how you are. And when you tell a child that, they'll internalize it. And they'll accept that about themselves. And they'll start thinking, well, I'm bad anyway. Might as well act it out. If that's the attitude, then how are you expecting to raise a child with a positive opinion even of themselves, much less anyone else? The dignity of a child matters. The, the, the value we give children matters. The way we speak to them matters. What they listen to matters. You know, can you imagine? Zayd ibn Aqam came to his uncle and told him exactly what Ibn Ubay said. Word for word. لَإِذْ رَجَعْنَا إِلَى الْمَدِينَةِ لَيُخْرِجَنَّ الْأَعَزُّ مِنْ هَلْأَدَنْ that's what he said. When we come back to the city, the dignified shall expel the humiliated. Those were his words. Quran, word for word, يَقُولُونَ لَإِرْ رَجَعْنَا إِلَى الْمَدِينَةِ لَيُخْرِجَنَّ الْأَعَزُّ مِنْهَا الْأَذَلْ وَلِلَّهِ الْعِزَّةِ وَلِرَسُولِهِ وَلِلْمُؤْمِنِينَ Ya Rabbi. Word for word, the report of Zayd became part of the Quran. Word for word. Those words were transmitted to the Prophet through Zayd, and then were retransmitted from Allah, confirming what Zayd said by the word, by the word, SubhanAllah. The value we must place on the dignity of children, to not dismiss the importance of having them listen to something valuable also. Think about this, as I, you know, my, my khutbah was going to be really about one of the ayat of the surah, but we didn't get to that, maybe at another occasion, inshallah ta'ala. And that is actually about children. The ayah is about children. Interestingly, the, most of the surah is about the hypocrites. And at the very end, Allah says, لا تُلْهِكُمْ أَقْوَالُكُمْ وَلَا أُولَادُكُمْ عَنْ ذِكْرِ اللَّهِ Like at the end, he changes the subject. وَخْفَخَاطَبَ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا You know, he addressed those who believe. But that's for another time. For now, what I want you to think about is, just like this child and his testimony and what he experienced shouldn't have been dismissed. The same way, think about the positive upbringing of a child. You know, now, nowadays we argue that we're just a product of our environment. And much of that is true. Human beings have to make their own choices, but their environment and how they were raised and the kind of influences they had has a huge impact on the kinds of the kind of personality you're going to have, the kind of choices you're going to make in life. But you think about a man who spent many years of his life in prison. If someone's lived, been in jail for 20 years, who have they been around? Criminals. Other people. And Maybe some of them have reformed, but maybe some of them haven't reformed. They haven't been, you can argue, in the best company. This, is, this may not be the best company for them. And that will have an impact on what kind of person they become. Before then, if there's a child who has no parental supervision, before even jail, if there's a, there's a young man with no parental supervision, no mom, no dad telling you this is right, this is wrong. This is okay, this is not okay. Nobody telling you to pray. Nobody telling you halal from halal, nothing. And you can imagine a child's going to do, as they grow up, as this kid becomes a teenager, they're going to do whatever they want and not feel bad about it. But when you think about Yusuf raised as a, practically, I mean, from a very early age, well, since he was taken away from his family, he's put in servitude. So he's actually in the service of a non-believing family, which don't have any concept of permissible and impermissible. So long as he does the service, he can do whatever he wants. There is no moral guidance for him in that environment. And from that environment, when he becomes a young man, falsely accused, where does he end up? In prison. 
And he's there for many years, surrounded by people that aren't exactly the best of character. As a matter of fact, one of them, who was a scam artist, is even mentioned in the story. You know what? You're right, Mr. Abdullah. So if that's the case, this terrible environment, this should shape the personality of Yusuf Alayhisam. Yet, the only positive influence you hear about, in Allah's own words, in the life of Yusuf Alayhisam, is the early childhood of Yusuf, when he's interacting with his father. And him and his father have such a close relationship that you don't actually hear father talking to son first, you hear son talking to father first. Now that's important. They have such a close relationship that the child sees a dream and shares the dream with his dad. And then the dad responds. When we think about raising our children, we keep thinking about what more do I tell them? What more do I tell them? What more do I tell them? Here you have a child who was given the kind of environment, but before he was told, he was heard. The child was heard. Now we have to ask ourselves, how much are we listening to our kids? How comfortable are our kids telling us without them even being asked. And if that is the case, then what we say will actually go inside. Otherwise, you can play YouTube videos. Otherwise, you can give your child lectures or drive them to programs and have them listen to speeches. We don't know what's going inside and what's not. But if we're giving them the space to voice and for their words to be heard with value, I mean, put yourself and myself in those shoes. If a seven-year-old, six-year-old came to you and said, I saw a dream, Baba. Here's what I saw. <clears throat> You're like, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, yeah, that's great. You're not going to be paying attention. It's just a dream. The kids just, you know. Or sometimes we ask our kids, kids, how was school? You're in the car, how was school? And your daughter starts talking, 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 and you're like, mm-hmm, that's great, that's great, that's great. And she could be saying whatever she wants. You're like, mm-hmm, that's awesome. She's like, I, I, you know, I kicked my friend in the face, and like, that's awesome. And, you know, I, I burnt the school down. She's experimenting now, saying crazy things, just to see if you're listening. You're like, alhamdulillah, very good, very good. Very good. You're not really listening. <coughs> when we actually become listeners, then that, those conversations can be so powerful no matter what environment I, our children end up in, they'll survive it like Yusuf Alayhi Salaam. Isn't that something? That those early years are the most important years for conversation. For conversation. We, so many parents come to me and tell me, what do I need to make my child memorize? What do they need to be reciting? What do they need to be learning? The most important thing, all of those things are beautiful. The most important thing are the conversations between parents and children. Those, those intimate, real conversations between parents and children where we get to understand the feelings, the fears, the emotions of our children and they completely open up to us before they open up to anyone else. If we can facilitate that, then their adult life will be something very, very different. Regardless of the bad influences on the outside. Regardless. They're not going to fall. And may Allah Azza protect all of our children. And may give us value for our children. And may Allah Azza wa not make us of those who overlooked our responsibility towards our children. May Allah Azza wa make the trial of those who are being tested with children easy for them. May Allah Azza wa make those of us whose children are, have become disrespectful or distant or angry or difficult to communicate with. May Allah Azza wa make those barriers easier and, and break those barriers and open up the hearts between parents and children once again. May Allah Azza wa make us better parents and make our children better children. خصوصا على أفضلهم وخاتم النبيين محمد الأمين وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين قال الله عز وجل في كتابه الكريم بعد أن أقول أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم إن الله وملائكته يصلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما اللهم صل على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما صليت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم في العالمين إنك حميد مجيد اللهم بارك على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما باركت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم في العالمين إنك حميد مجيد عباد الله رحمكم الله اتقوا الله إن الله يأمر بالعدل والإحسان وإيتاء ذي القربى وينهى عن الفحشاء والمنكر ولا ذكر الله أكبر والله يعلم ما تصنعون أقم الصلاة إن الصلاة كانت على المؤمنين كتابا مقبولا الله أكبر الله أكبر أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله 
أشهد أن محمد رسول الله حي على الصلاة حي على الفلاح قد قامت الصلاة قد قامت الصلاة الله أكبر الله أكبر لا إله إلا الله الله